The Battle of White Wolf Mountain was a classical battle where the Han nobility defeated the powerful nomadic tribes living near the border, collectively known as the Wu Huan. Up until now, they were a tributary of either the Han or the Xiongnu dynasties, but they were finally establishing some degree of independence under their own leaders, until Cao Cao's military group of cavalry attained victory in this important battle, dashing the hopes of a Wu Huan dominion. Since the destruction of Gong Sun San, Yuan Shao granted the Wu Huan chieftains beyond the borders insignia, which they used as titles to become supreme rulers. Yuan Shao reinforced these alliances by marrying the daughters of his subordinates to them, pretending as though the daughters were his own. When Qi Yu Li Ju, the leader of the Wu Huan tribes, died, his son was still young, so Tadun succeeded him in his stead. He was well known among his people for his wisdom, command skills, strength, and ferocity, but by the time of Yuan Shao's death, Lu Ban had come of age, so Tadun rightfully gave the reins of power over to him. While other chiefs like Nan Lu and Su Pu Yan pledged themselves to Lu Ban, Tadun went to Liao Shi and remained in charge of the united tribes there. His military leadership, paired with his apparent strength, prompted rumours that he was seeking to emulate the founder of the Xiongnu by creating a hegemony over the northern nomadic tribes. In the year 204, Yuan Shang arrived seeking shelter under Tadun, so he also gained command over a considerable number of their followers. His combined force of Wu Huan and Chinese was said to have numbered over 300,000, so he attempted to help the Yuans regain control over some territories for some years, but to no avail. In the raids, the Wu Huan were said to have kidnapped over 100,000 Chinese families, so Cao Cao contemplated the elimination of the Wu Huan threat. From the autumn of 206 to springtime in 207, Dong Xiao oversaw the construction of two canals, the Pinglu Trench and the Chuanzhou Trench. They flowed far to the north, so could be used as waterways for ships to transport supplies. While the works were underway, some generals like Zhang Liao tried to dissuade Cao Cao from campaigning so far to the north. Yuan Shang is an enemy in flight. The barbarians are selfish and have no feeling of affection for him, so why should they try support him? If we advance deep into their territory, Liu Bei will certainly persuade Liu Biao to raid the capital. Should they make trouble there, you will have no chance for second thoughts. Gu Ajia argued that a swift attack was the best course of action for the following three reasons. The northern barbarians are deluded by a false sense of security since they're far away from the Chinese heartlands. This miscalculation can be taken advantage of. If they are attacked quickly, they can be defeated and destroyed. If Cao Cao turns his military south instead, then the Wu Huan will cause even more trouble, so the newly captured northern territories will also be lost. Finally, he didn't think Liu Biao could be convinced to attack Xu, because all he did was sit and talk. Plus, Liu Biao didn't trust Liu Bei's growing popularity, so he was concerned if he became too powerful. At the same time, Liu Bei would be too reluctant to serve him if he only had a lesser position. Cao Cao was in favour of Gu Ajia's analysis, so he marched his army to Yijing in the summer of 207. This city was turned into the base camp for his campaign, then he advanced to Wuzhong, where the local leader Dian Chou submitted to him. The obvious line of attack from Wuzhong was through the plains along the coastline of the Bohai Sea, so the army set off in August or September, but scouts soon reported that the monsoon had set in. The heavy rain flooded the low-lying areas and drenched the roads in mud, making terrain impassable. The Wu Huan also anticipated attacks from this direction, so they firmly held the river crossings. For some time, Cao Cao's army could not advance. Dian Chou knew the area well and had run-ins with the Wu Huan before. He predicted that the Wu Huan were convinced any force that could not advance through the plains had to turn back. He knew of an old disused road, however, that led to the abandoned Han frontier lands, so turned to Cao Cao to give his advice. Tadun's head can be taken without a single battle, he exclaimed as he mapped out a route through the undefended Wu Huan territory, leading to an attack where they least expect it. Cao Cao led his army back to Wuzhong, but had his men erect signs on the roads near the water which read, It's the middle of summer, and the road is impassable. We are waiting for autumn or winter to resume the advance. The enemy apparently believed that Cao Cao really retreated, which was a grave miscalculation. To lower the chance of the army alerting the Wu Huan to their presence, Cao Cao took Gu Ajia's advice to heart. Leave the baggage train behind, he advised. Swiftness is the key in war. Dian Cho guided Cao Cao, who led his lightly armoured cavalry force, to embark on a remarkable military adventure. They climbed the hills of Xu Wu, then exited the Chinese frontier through the Lulong Pass. Exiting into the upper valley of the Luan River, they marched around 400 miles through difficult terrain. Turning east at Pingang, the expedition force crossed the grazing fields of the Xi'an Bay, then re-entered the mountain ranges that served as the Han's borders. By now, Cao Cao had flanked Tadun's defensive position, 
and was advancing on a line to the sea which would divide the enemy territory in half. The encounter was sudden for both armies when Sauta reached the valley of the Daling River. Tadun and his allies realised what was happening, so hastily withdrew their frontline defences to face Taotao in the north. Tens of thousands of Wu Huan gathered around Tadun, Yuan Shang, and Yuan Shi, including the supreme rulers, Lu Ban and Wu Yan. Cao Tao's men became fearful as the tribes rallied from the mountains. Faced against superior numbers and without any extra equipment, the lightly armoured troops were hesitant. The Wu Huan were just as unprepared for this battle, so they did not harass the incoming army's advance, nor did they take up any proper formations. Zhang Liao, however, displayed great fervour and strongly wanted the attack to get underway. Cao Tao was so impressed that he passed Zhang Liao his personal signal flag, then boldly climbed the slope of the mountain to spy on the enemy formation. When he saw they didn't have one and were acting without orders, he immediately unleashed Zhang Liao to exploit this weakness. The battle was a decisive one as the coordinated light force, which included Zhang He, quickly defeated the Wu Huan cavalry. Cao Chun led the tiger and leopard cavalry, who captured Tadun in a very short time, so the battle was over quickly. He was put to death by Zhang Liao, then many of his men were also killed, but over 200,000 Chinese settlers and tribesmen surrendered to Cao Cao. In one single engagement, Cao Cao had broken the back of the Wu Huan resistance. The Yuan brothers fled with the surviving Wu Huan leadership and a few thousand horsemen to Gongsun Kang and Liao Dong. Cao Cao's army eventually marched into Lui Cheng, for there he halted, making no intention to attack, despite his subordinates urging him to do so. He later explained that applying pressure to Liao Dong may bind Yuan Shang and Gongsun Kang against him, but if he left them to their devices, they would quarrel. A few days after they arrived, the Yuan brothers and their Wu Huan allies were not spared, decapitated, then their heads were all sent to Cao Cao. He finally led his army back to the central plains after this, but not before a particularly difficult withdrawal. The coldness of early winter, food shortage and a drought all took their toll on Cao Cao's men, where many of them perished. Guo Jia, whose advice immensely helped the cause, and the former warlord Zhang Xiu were among those who did not make it back. Cao Tao complimented the advisers who advised against the campaign, acknowledging that the venture had been dangerous, risky, and that he was blessed with good fortune to be alive. He announced he would distribute his wealth amongst those who had aided him, then enfiefed over 20 of his followers as Ma Kui. The success in the north brought Cao Tao tremendous prestige, as his domination of northern China was now unchallenged. He took the title of Chancellor as the northern frontiers became bolstered with guards, so he could now fully focus his military attention on Liu Biao in the south. On the other hand, the defeat at White Wolf Mountain scattered the Wu Huan tribes. Some of them who had not joined Talon's ill-fated resistance came to formally submit to Tao Tao and their horsemen became known as the finest cavalry force in the empire. Other remnants took refugee past the western borders of Liao Dong, then throughout the years they were absorbed into the stronger nearby governing powers. Some assimilated with the Chinese, but most joined in with the Xi'an Bay. The Wu Huan's political identity and their ability to remain independent was lost. For the most part, they ceased to be seen as an independent people altogether. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button, and I'll see you next time.